Hello, everybody. This is Matt Orozco from Macabre Daily here, and I am so excited to be speaking with John Ainsley today, who is the writer, director, and I also saw, I think, music uh, producer for Do Not Disturb, uh, which is coming out uh, theatrically November 17th and then coming out on VOD November 21st. So, John, thanks for taking some time to speak with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, John, I'll dive right into it. I know that a lot of folks may know who you of you from some of your previous works like Jack Brooks, Monster Slayer, and some of the uh, notoriety that gave you. I know that uh, we're big fans of that film over here at Macabre Daily. But Do Not Disturb is a pretty different film altogether in a lot of ways. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what were your inspirations for the film? Um, I mean, there's a lot of like different places. Cinematically, I would say Will Friedkin's Bug was a huge influence on this one. The idea of two, like a couple in a hotel room losing their minds and progressing, deteriorating as the movie progresses. That movie was like tonally a huge influence. I mean, Polanski's early apartment trilogies are always a big influence on me. Um, also kind of allowing the comedy and violence of like a Pulp Fiction to uh, throw me a lot of influence. And then, you know, like I'm a big fan of like outside of cinema, it's also like Frank Zappa and Monty Python and that blend of sort of sort of seriousness with comedy um, that sort of blends together, you know, somewhat effortlessly sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there definitely is a comedy of the absurd happening in the film where there are things that um, you're almost kind of unsure if you're supposed to laugh at it. Uh, you're like, oh, this is this is funny, but um, I'm not almost judging myself for for finding it that way. Um, you know, narratively, were there any specific kind of things that drew you to this particular story? You know, like this is such a, and I say this because this is um, there's not a lot of movies that kind of deal with what happens when you know two people just kind of hang out and you know things shit proverbially hits the fan. So I'm just wondering, is there any kind of experience in your yeah. life or anything kind of brought you to this really gnarly story? Um, I think a, lot, a couple of weird relationships um, in my past, maybe, sort of. I mean, that's, yeah. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I did my fair share of psychedelics. Um, my next question, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was always, I don't know, I mean, the relationship thing is the core of the movie and everything else sort of plays second fiddle to that. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting. I mean, the big one, even before, even after I'd written the first draft, I didn't fully understand what it was about. Um, and then it was really about massaging the, this, the following drafts with that idea that cannibalism as a metaphor for um, the way we eat each other alive in emotionally in bad relationships and how sort of being in a comfortable relationship um, brings out the worst in us sometimes. Um, it can bring out the best too, but when you're in the wrong relationship, you sort of behave towards each other really badly. And I think it's like probably our worst, uh, outside of wars and torture and all that, it's, uh, I think everyone has experienced a moment where they act out of jealousy or in a passive aggressive manner that they later are ashamed of whether they want to admit it or not. <laughs> Yeah, I think the admitting part is the hard part of that equation because yeah. as human beings, we're quite prideful. But there is a lot of, you know, kind of cognitive dissonance that happens in relationships where you kind of gaslight yourself sometimes to believe that this is worth it or that maybe if, you know, kind of like the character of Chloe, you know, she kind of has a thing. We're not going to go into spoilers here, but, you know, she does something to try and keep things together that, um, you know, clearly doesn't make her feel very good about it, even and something that she even knows is kind of morally a bit, a bit, wrong so there is that kind of sense of we do tend to and not only acts against our own interests but also our partner's interests when we kind of stay to these toxic relationships um, yeah you start like i mean she acts out of spite i mean even the taking of the drugs i don't think that is a spoiler but she that's out of spite it's not out of any desire to uh <clears throat> experience anything except for placating this dude that she's stuck in a hotel room with so and who's absolutely just, you know, he's fully torqued when he gets to this hotel. Like it, I think the part that was most shocking was, you know, there's no, um, there's no filler, I guess, between the moment when they arrive to immediately noticing that this relationship is on the rocks, just his like complete lack of attention paid to the people that are talking to him heads down on his phone. And then as soon as they get in room, like, I feel like he was ripping a shot or something like that. So it's just this strange, like, I mean, I've always been excited for vacations, but, um, 
don't know <laughs> if I start off that torque, you know, to, to get going. Yeah, I mean, it was really kind of a balance of showing how disconnected they were and um, using those early scenes in ways to sort of paint them as a, a couple. And so they're comfortable with each other, but also paint them. I mean, they don't answer each other's questions. They barely, like a lot of their dialogue makes no sense because they literally don't communicate with each other, even though they're talking together completely. And then that's first scene is when I do that a lot is she'll make a statement on something and then he'll make a statement on something and then it'll come back, but it, it just goes in circles a lot of times. So. Yeah. I, and I think the part that really stands out the why and why it works, I guess, because um, full disclosure, I really enjoyed the film. We'll have a right. We'll have a review coming up later this week, but but we'll talk more in detail about that. But, you know, there is this, um, there's just this, 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 uh, this unsettlingness to their relationship that I, it, you actually see in some of the worst relationships, either, I've been in or observed and kind of friends of mine have been in where there's no love. Um, and it's almost like we're doing this thing because we don't know what else to do. Um, lost love so to some extent. And, you know, the psychedelic angle is really interesting to me. Um, one, because you did an amazing job actually visually articulating that experience. Cause um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, one of my questions here is have you ever experimented? So the answer is yes, but you know, to some extent, um, I've never had that kind of experience, although I can say that there's parts of it that, you know, the losing track of time kind of feeling like, where did all of it go? Um, have you had anything so adverse in your experiences that kind of fueled some of the imagery or, or some of the thoughts here? Or was it all just kind of like, what's the craziest shit that could happen if someone were to take something like this? No, I mean, a lot of it was toning down and, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and sort of trying to keep it believable so that the audience, whether you've done, say, acid or mushrooms or peyote even or ayahuasca, it, whether you've done it or not, the audience they might be able to experience it in that disorientation using continuity um, and time as that device sort of narratively, but also in the edit. Um, and then also in the picture, I guess, too. But it was trying to like help someone experience that who'd never experienced it before. And then if you have, it's sort of leads to sort of like a flashback type of experience because you watch like like I love Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas but those hallucinations are not necessarily indicative of what the actual trip is it's more about just losing sense of your sense of self and where you are in the world and so that was like when she you know she moves on the camera and we're playing with continuity and then he's on the other side of the couch when he was on the other side of the room and there's no cuts it's day and then it's night and then, you know, you check your clock and like, oh, six, seven hours, 12 hours have gone by. Where did they go? So I kind of like that because as you're watching the movie, you sort of trust the narrator. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I've been misled. So it, it, the idea is to put the viewer in the same state of mind as the, the characters with that. I, I think the editing, in fact, I had something here to ask you. How did you work with the director of photography and the editor to help ensure that that tone was kept through? Because this isn't something like you can't just direct those scenes, right? Like there is a lot that has to be done in post that help to kind of bring that, bring that together, but also the, how you frame them. Um, I think of the table with the stakes, you know, like the plates, like one second, they look at the table, there's nothing there. The next second they look at the same table and there's just these plate of like, you know, uh, bones <laughs> with, with little, with very little meat on them. So how was that relationship between the three of you, you know, working not only during the filming, but also in post? Um, pretty easy. It was my first time working with, well, I guess not my first time, first time working on a feature with Scott, the cinematographer. And he's really great. He understands, um, he does some writing as well. So he's kind of got a narrative understanding of storytelling, um, which some cinematographers have more than others. So he's really, I mean, we're both pretty visually orientated, but his kind of commitment to story and character over visuals um helps because then when you're on that same page you can just find the frame better and a lot of his suggestions were concurrent or conducive to the story as well as looking great um and then his ability to like light simply because i hate lights um i hate a movie that doesn't look good and i hate a movie that doesn't look you know gorgeously lit but i hate lights and i don't want lights on my set i don't like walking around flags and sea stands and having tons of like people carrying things in and out and i really don't like that jungle like i, I look i've been on other people's sets and i watch them go through this labyrinth between where they are at the monitor and where they and then where the actors are and it drives me mental so <clears throat> we kept it really simple and one light source blasting into the outdoor window 
And then I think we used like the lamps, the practicals, then we'd occasionally have a tube, but not much. So if you like to look at this set, there wasn't much. You could walk on and not know it was a film set because there's so <laughs> few lights available, uh, which allows sort of me to be closer to the actors and sort of get, and allows the actors to move freely in their performance. So Scott's great for that. Um, Scott's also really cool in that he doesn't really mind that I do a lot of the um, handheld camera operating because I like, I just like feeling it. I used to be an operator and I like looking through that viewfinder and I like moving with the characters. And once you get to see their, the actors pacing, you kind of, the camera sort of moves with that um, emotionally or organically. Um, so that's easy. And then Jordan, the editor I've worked with, man, I don't even know how many short films we've done, but he also cut my first feature. Um, so him and I have a shorthand that's pretty easy and we're kind of at a stage now where we're able to sort of go back and forth. And so during the day I might edit a little scene and then give it to him and he'll finesse it and we'll go back. And it's just a lot of chatting together about the edit and his personality works because we kind of agree and disagree on the right amount of things so that we could work together really easily, but he'll challenge me in, in, in places where I've got to defend what I'm doing. Um, like there's a scene, I think the scene where Jack pees, that was probably four times longer in my version of the edit, <laughs> <laughs> which is funny, but it was also at the wrong time in the movie where I don't yeah. think the audience was quite into it yet. But anyways, he saves me from, uh, my wife does too. My wife's a producer on the <laughs> film. And she kind of gives me those notes that saves me from myself because I find I'll defend some of them I defend and push back on, but there's a point I think when you're arguing what you want if you're honest with yourself you know that you're on it you're arguing honestly or dishonesty <laughs> so yeah. you know some of them you got to be indulgent occasionally but if you do it too often you lose your you lose the point of the film so no I get that I mean there's definitely some filmmakers out there that I think um on overindulge and I think it's obvious because you know unless you're in on that joke it feels like all right we got to get this thing going um, and having that kind of constructive conflict, you know, in the editing process, I think is always, you don't want a bunch of sycophants, you know, kind of around you making, you know, making you feel like every decision yeah. you've made is the best one you could have. You really want people that are going to treat this as their art as much as it is yours. Cause it is, you know, ultimately the product of collaboration as much as it is just one singular vision. Yeah. Um, you, see, you see that a lot in films after a person's been successful. Yeah. You see their long edits and there's, there's places where you can see they should have cut, they should have not shot a scene. And I think the best filmmakers don't really have that. You know, you, um, the best filmmakers have strong editors, strong cinematographers, strong producers around them to push back and don't yes them to death. So. <laughs> yeah. that I mean, I would say as someone who's still advocating for the return of the 90 minute average runtime, um, I think that there is there's a lot more that can be done to optimize the efficiency of storytelling. Um, but I think that, again, to the credit of this film, particularly in Do Not Disturb, it's just once you're in, you know, the first 15 minutes are really kind of getting you, helping you understand the relationship. After that, it's like, all right, now we're going to understand this experience that these people are going to go through. And once that kicks off, I was just absolutely transfixed. Um, a lot of tension, you know, I can, I always monitor my body language whenever I'm watching movies to kind of get a sense of how into this am I? And I was doing a lot of this and like a lot of balled up fists. So I'm like, I'm right there with them. Cause I've been in that, I've been in a bad place, not that bad, but I've been in some bad places, um, because of just, you know, the way in which the brain will play, brain will play tricks on you. Um, but I, I want to focus on the actors for a moment because both Chloe and Jack, um, Kudos to the both of them for, uh, but I, I forgot, I don't have their name off the top of my head, but they, uh, they're, Christopher and Rogan Christopher. yeah, they're, they're, they could not have done a better job of articulating this really just painful relationship. Um, and they both seem to really own those characters. How, how was it working with them to get those performances? Was this something where you really had to Kind of coach a little bit of this out of them did they bring something to it i mean because it's just it's very authentic and genuine and i think with this kind of high emotion this kind of high drum especially kind of where things go it never loses touch with reality it always stays grounded enough where this could have happened um but a lot of it comes down to their interactions and how they how they portray it so what was it like work with them and what kind of coaching did you do with them to get this out of them um well i mean then, they're both they both did the um, 
the neighborhood playhouse at New York. So they both had similar, some of their training was already similar. And so they could kind of approach it in the same way from a, I guess, a technical perspective. Um, with Jack, it was really, or Rogan, it was really kind of, we went through a number of different types of character trying to figure out what he did for a living, how much money he brought in, what his parents situation was. And those kind of like getting very specific about who he was as a person and what he was doing and, and what she expected from him and what, what he kind of was, his goals were. And because he's such a useless guy, it's very <laughs> difficult to narrow down aimlessness, you know, because there, there's, there's his true goals. I, I don't, they, they they still kind of elude me of like, yeah. does he just want to get laid? Does he just want like an easy but he doesn't want an easy wife because Chloe's not that easy on him, but she kind of tolerates his stupidity. Um, and I think as he, maybe when he was younger, that kind of worked when she was younger. And then he, as he's growing, I think he's maybe being challenged by that. But um, no, I mean, with Rogan, it was a matter of coming up with the word a man child. Yep. <laughs> From that point forward, he sort of just got it. And we didn't really, I mean, we played with the performance a bit, but the goal was always like behave like a scorned five, six year old. And um, you see that when he gets stoned, he's, he's acting like she's his mom. And he's like, she's like, what day? And he's like, it's not, he doesn't have great answers. And he always, he's impulsive, doesn't really think before he speaks. Um, and with Kim, Kim sort of just got it. There's something in her life that she brought to that character that I'm vaguely aware of, but not really. <laughs> I'm fine with it because it just sort of yeah. worked. I didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to over talk it or overthink it. Um, first time we spoke we spoke about three or four hours on the phone just about life and relationships and not the script and um and then i think we spoke one more time on the phone after that and then we just showed up on set and just did it and wow. and uh, with kim it was just effortless um she inherently just got the character and what she brought to it, I just loved. So it was kind of weird the first few days because usually I'm a director that likes to play a lot. I like to block a lot. I like to do a lot, not a lot, but I like to do seven, five to seven takes or nine. And I like to throw the first three away, but she was just bringing it on the first or second take often. So then we can play a bit, but it was weird. I kind of felt useless a bit. <laughs> I was getting what I, what I wanted right away and I wanted to play but there's no reason to and we moved fast because we had a uh, we only had 11 days in that hotel um sorry not 11 days we had 11 days in that town but we had probably nine eight or nine days in that hotel so we covered that first day wow. we covered all of the um, scene where they walk in the hotel room for the first time and that evening's argument which I think <laughs> is about a 12 page day of some pretty heavy drama and uh and they just dove right in so it was uh it was pretty scary <laughs> yeah i mean i can imagine that the intensity just to be able to dive right into that i mean i think that's hallmarks of just great performance you know great actors right there yeah so their know, ability to channel that um, well your ability to just be and, let, and not overthink it i think that's what i learned most on this production is just don't think feel and when you're writing and when you're prepping and a little bit when you're editing later on, you can think, but when you're on the floor and just working it, it's thinking is the enemy. You just gotta, does it feel right or does it not feel right? And then it works. Yeah, I mean, we people don't often trust their gut. I forget the name of the book, but there's a gentleman who wrote a book about how we don't trust our gut instincts enough and they often tend to be far more correct than they are wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think when it comes to their performances, you know, again, so much of the film rests on the idea that you have to buy that this couple one does at one point did care for each other yeah. and now they're in a space that if you've ever been in a relationship before that where you're you're on different tiers right like one person is either more ahead of where they think they should be the other person's maybe somewhat stunted in their sense of growth or development um but that misalignment you know like i'll i think the steam that sticks out that really hits the man child part that you're kind of talking the mothering was that first night where they go out to the club and they come back the next morning and they're just absolutely hung over to hell. And he just goes and kind of like apologizes like a kid would apologize to his mom. Like, I'm sorry, you know, and then like lies on her legs and like a mom, she's just not having it. She's like, I'm just going to get out of here. Like, I don't want to be around this. So yeah, and she it just works. forget what happens at first out of, out of sort of a protecting, not wanting to deal with it herself. 
Yeah, it's I mean, I can understand why he's he's a lot. He's a lot to handle. <laughs> Um, and he doesn't, and he, you're right, he doesn't think about anything before. So she's constantly having to play the calculus game of how do I react to this new thing happening that I wasn't expecting without A, flying off the handle or B, you know, doing what I want to do, right? Because she, she's in a lose-lose situation for a good chunk of the film. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one of the things I love to ask about this process is, you know, what are one of, the, one of the most rewarding things that you experience, you know, either during production or post? And then what are the, one of the most challenging things you face as far as bringing a story to life? Oh, well, the, I mean, the, the hardest thing was just pitching it and getting people to understand. And I still don't think the people who financed it understood it fully until they started. Because <laughs> um, it is kind of a weird movie. And I remember at one point, one of them had a note to be like, oh, when he like hits Wayne with the lamp, that might play funny. You want to be careful about that. I'm like, well, no, no, it's supposed to be funny. Yeah. And, you know, getting into like, why is dismembering someone or hitting someone with a lamp funny? um i don't know about the the why but it is funny uh, and that goes back to the tarantino thing when you know when when he shoots marvin and it's just yeah. travolta's reaction of just like i shot marvin in the face like it's nothing is what's funny about that scene um and that kind of like that kind of humor bled but it was sort of like i've never done that before i mean with jack we sort of had like classic sort of horror comedy yeah and then uh my first film the sublet that had no comedy there was one line that i thought was funny and then i I took it out in post because it just didn't play because nothing else was funny in that i mean there's parts that make me laugh and it's funny because when we premiered it there were a lot of moments that laughed and that kind of gave me the <clears throat> uh the confidence to do the comedy in this one because i remember on set my wife was produced it was sometimes she'd look at me she's like i hope you know what you're doing um, <laughs> it was just like moments I know that look <laughs> so bizarre um, you know, the, especially Wayne, when he's sort of mourning Wendy, that scene is very, I had no clue how that was going to work. Um, and I kind of just shot it and trusted that my gut was right. But, uh, that one in the, uh, when Wayne, when Wendy comes into the room and Chloe's in the corner and Jack is stoned out of a skull dance and that scene's a crazy scene too. And it was really those last three big scenes are actually there's a lot going on and there's a lot going on separated from each other there's always one character who's isolated and two that are together and then they come together and that kind of stuff just boggle like I, it's really hard to visualize um <clears throat> so luckily luckily it all kind of worked um and then rewarding like composing the score was really huge um because i'd never well not not only had i never composed a score before oh, wow. i never would have thought I could compose a score before um so that was kind of fun to play with sounds because really it was like I don't know if I'd call it music I mean I have some musical background I don't really understand musical theory but I mean I played in bands most of my life but score and composing is a little different and I knew what I wanted was sounds that represent represented Chloe's state of mind and so a lot of that was pulling organic sounds out of that synth. I mean, there's moments when she's contemplating, it sounds like a, a crocodile. There's like, you know, whistling kettles buried in there. There's just different things to trigger your sort of natural emotion without being obvious. Um, and that was kind of weird. It was kind of like hard to sort of explain that. I did work with a, a composer briefly and it didn't, <clears throat> it didn't work. And I think a lot of it was in my head and I couldn't get yeah. it out. And then once we started giving each other notes too much, it was like, I wanted to work with them again in the future. And I knew if we kept <laughs> progressing the way we were doing it, we would hate each other in a couple of weeks. So I just said, listen, I'm going to use my own thing and we'll work together next year or whatever. <laughs> um, just because this movie, I think this movie was just so small and, and because I wrote it, directed it. I was very involved in the shooting and editing and I think I was just like in it. Yeah. Um, and so I think it was difficult at that point because um, you're kind of done the film by the time the composer comes on board and you're sort of like in a rhythm and you're bringing this person in late. It was, uh, it was interesting. Anyways, it was fun. I, I loved uh, composing it. Um, I, I can see, you know, that the soundtrack does add this kind of, I think what I what, what works about it quite well is that it never really overwhelms what's what's happening when 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 the when the dialogue of the action is heavy. It's just there to unsettle you. 
Um, and I think that's the part that stands out. You know, you mentioned there's kind of the tea kettle sounds. Like I was, I don't think I picked up on any specific noise per se, but a lot of it sounded vaguely familiar. And so, it, but it had this like sense of like, I don't know if it's more, more drawing me in, but just it met the, the music, the sounds match the tone of yeah. what I believe these characters were going through at this time. And if you've ever been on any sort of psychedelic drug, you know, you do know that there's like an auditory component to this, the hallucination right. where like sounds are enhanced. Music does sound better. Some things sound stranger. Um, so there is that kind of idea that like, this isn't so much a soundtrack as a soundscape for their delusion and their yeah. slow deterioration into complete insanity. Yeah, and I wanted to make sure there was no um, percussion at all, because I think, I mean, there is a little bit here and there, but it's, I think percussion helps you keep time, mm. whether you're you're tapping your finger or whatever it is, but so if there's no percussion, it plays into the whole time is sort of fluid in this movie thing. So yeah, it was really about representing Chloe's state of mind. I think 80% of it. There's two pieces where I think they go into Jack when he's like hiding the salsa or the peyote and the salsa. And then uh, there's another one. Oh, when he's panicking, trying to make the bed. Her face after she found that out. I mean, I, I, I in my mind, I'm like, how pissed would I be? And I'm like, I would be so mad. <laughs> um, it's, it's fun in a movie theater. Like uh, the audience is always like cringing when he's like <laughs> hiding it. And they're like, no, no, no. And it's, it's fun to watch this movie with an audience because, uh, or at least a genre horror audience. I think you can watch it with an intellectual audience and just hate it, but <laughs> I don't know. I'd love to see their reactions to some of these things because some of these are very much, you know, there are some horror beats that horror fans are really going to get a lot, of, a lot out of, but, you know, I think your comparison to Bug in the beginning was actually quite an apt one in that that movie entirely relies on the paranoia. Of yeah. you're, you're not so much worried about like, what's happening to them is bad, but what's worse is what they're kind of doing to each other. And that's the part that I think sticks out the most uh, for me for this is that if someone who's, you know, this is the kind of movie I would actually ask my wife, like, hey, would you want to watch this one with me? Just so I could watch how she reacts to these things. Because there's some very human, like, awfulness in here that everyone could probably relate to by way of either having that similar experience or, you know, my wife and I have been to Miami before. We've had some wild nights out there. So, like, we know what it's like when you get swept up into, you know, South Beach or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, last two questions for you is just, you know, what what's next? Um, do you have anything on the horizon that you're working on or excited about? Um, I have a lot that I'm working on and a lot that I'm excited about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone's got checks with lots of zeros at the end. I'll take them. Um, I've got a, I've got She Came Knocking, which is, uh, I think, likely to be my next film. It depends on, depends on an actor saying yes or an actress saying yes, and then the money coming in. But I'm working on that with a producer and uh, we're just trying to find cast for it right now um, that will trigger financing. Uh, that's based on a short film that I'm pretty sure you can dig up on the internet somewhere. Um, and I expanded it into a feature. Um, I've got a couple action films that I'm hoping to make at some point. And then I've got another, another couple comedies that I'm working on. Um, and I say comedies with the assumption that you know my work well enough that uh, there's going to be a lot of blood in that comedy. Um, but there's a film called Hollywood Rejects Strike Back about a young actress who is, well, not actually a young actress, but a, an actress who is um, entirely fed up with Hollywood and decides to confront everyone in LA who she feels may have fucked her over in the past. Um, yeah, so it, it's a fun one. It's comedic um, and it's pretty poignant, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds poignant, at least, given that we've just gone over a strike um, and yeah. a lot of, you know, both the writers and the Screen Actors Guild uh, were really put through the ringer um, these past few months. Um, so I think there's no better time in the present for people to to really understand the struggles of those working and yeah. relying on Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not fun. Um, it's just, it's funny because I was talking to a producer after Do Not Disturb got made and he was saying, he's like, man, it's just like, I'm starting to think making movies is impossible. And even though he gets movies made, it's like, I'm on four scripts now that I've had produced. And yet if someone asked me how to get a film made, I wouldn't have an answer. So I, and then how do you get your next one made? It's very complicated. I don't really, it's a lot of luck. And, um, you know, if you don't stop trying, you haven't failed. <laughs> it's the only yeah. way to look at it. <laughs> I actually think that's a t-shirt right there. <laughs> yeah, don't stop trying. You haven't failed. 
Um, I mean, eventually you'll die, but I guess that's not really failure. But that's yeah, that's more just the natural. Someone. That's someone when I was younger, someone gave me that piece of advice. He's like, well, you know, just keep pushing. And eventually everyone you're competing with or anyone who's working now is going to be dead or they'll quit. <laughs> they'll left, so they have to pick you. I'm like, interesting. <laughs> Well, if we were ever to see some empirical data on what is the average age of success that most people are, whatever we consider success for this for this yeah. equation, you know, I think think they're um, both, <laughs> yeah, right. If you could, do you have a mortgage and are you able to pay it? Um, yeah. You know, I think that there's an element though of I because we talked to a lot of filmmakers for our site and you know um, a lot of independent filmmakers in particular, and we asked them all usually, you know, what are the tricks to getting made? I stopped asking the question largely because. The answer is almost always the same as, as you said, no one can really tell you, like, there's no secret, there's no silver bullet. It really is, do you care enough to keep doing it? Do you know enough people that want to do it as well? And yeah. can you find people, can you find people with enough money to make it happen? Um, and there are those avenues, you know, but at the same time, it is a matter of, I, I think the most consistent through line probably is just, you have to have a sense of a dedication to the craft that you want to, you're willing to make this happen um, because all those other variables are not necessarily working for you until you get them to a right place. Yeah, I mean, you can't control any of it. And that's on this one, I really learned to just love the process and being on set and working because it's the only thing, it's the only part of the movie that's guaranteed. And yeah. so even like with Do Not Disturb, I mean, I could have had it made a couple different times um, under a different scenario that I don't think would have achieved the same results. Um, producers or financiers who wanted to lean into the trope or the sex you know and then treat it very differently so I was very fortunate to get these guys who just trusted me and let me do my thing <laughs> well their trust was well placed I, I will say and I think a lot of folks are going to get a kick out of this and my last question for you is um you're queuing up a double feature before do not disturb um I know you already mentioned bug but is there another movie you would put in front of this as like a nice companion piece or even a, a warm-up bug in this one would be a, like a heck of a double feature but it'd be heavy to take i think you'd have to go with something <clears throat> i don't know it's a good question i had one in my head i mean it, it's funny because if you put pulp fiction with this one you'd sort of notice a lot of things that i stole from pulp. well not stole <laughs> but borrowed but like you can see the uh when before they go into that party I shot Kim and Jack exactly, or pretty close to exact, um, the way before Vince and Jules are facing that door and talking, turning and talking to each other. I had them never look at each other when they're talking to show their disconnect. Mm. So whenever he's talking to her, she's looking at the door and then she'll respond and he'll look away and it's sort of triggered. And then the t-shirt, which I'm actually wearing the Miami t-shirt now that she wears at the end, she has a yellow version, just similar to the Pulp Fiction thing. There's another one too. There's a few different things in there that are just small. Um, Miami Vice would be fun, even though it has nothing to do with the film. Just the 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 aura of Miami is. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like the Miami Vice feature, but I loved it. Um, it's it's a very good like Michael Mann my Vice movie. Like it is very much the cool, yeah. sexy Miami, um, but it also is like you know I think folks that would compare it to the TV series are kind of missing the point of adapting something for the present. <laughs> but it's funny because the narrative of that movie is in the series like even the line some of the dialogue is in there so and and i think people think of season one of miami vice more than they think of the later seasons which were mm -hmm. a little darker in tone and and more serious so i don't know i love them i love it. the first time i saw the theater i loved it and then i watch it every other year or so so it's a it's a fun one doesn't get talked about enough and i think it's because again michael mann movies are the kind of things that you i think people either love them or they hate them there's no middle ground on yeah. them because That's they are a little dry, but they're also really stylized and they're really kind of deep and some, you know, they're almost like noir in that sense that they kind of have this undertone of them, that this nastiness and this dread. Um, a lot of it's lighting, right? Like you, you mentioned lighting before, but the way you all were able to capture the look of an actual kind of, I've, I haven't been to the hotel you all are in, but I have been in a hotel like the one you're in just yeah. based on the lighting and the look of the furniture. It's, the funny thing is that hotel is in a small town called Sault Ste. Marie in Northern Ontario. Um, it's a quality inn, I think. Um, I think it was a quality inn or a comfort inn. It's comfort inn. I don't know, one or the other. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, that was just like that. And then the outside's obviously in Miami. But yeah, we shot, even the club scene was shot in Canada 
in this oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, restaurant that that was the challenge was uh, the the biggest challenge was that restaurant and making the restaurant feel Miami because all the walls were black and you couldn't see out the window because there was like pine trees out there. So that's very of, Miami. <laughs> no. And uh, that was that was one of the harder things. But the other movie, I think it let's scare Jessica to death is another under under underloved film and i think it has some problems but its soundtrack was a huge influence on what i did here and also the way she loses her mind is uh yeah that's a I, I, that, I don't know why that movie doesn't get more love i think it's because it's a hard film to connect with and if you if you expect you know really action-oriented films like i think we're kind of in the high distractibility stage of our of our attention span cycles so without enough like kind of bang and sizzle um a movie like let's scare jessica death really takes its time and it and it's unnerving in a way that um i think most people will just write off as boring um yeah. but i think that the unnervingness is that you're actually like you're actually watching someone lose their mind and like what it's like to be a paranoid kind of you know a paranoid presence around others who who don't understand you those movies about people losing their mind like repulsion is probably the most famous <clears throat> but um whatever happened to baby Jane and um, uh, what's the other one? It's on the black and white picture. With, uh, I can't remember now. Anyways. Mm. Okay. I mean, there's also the Ellen Burson performance in Requiem for a Dream, which yeah, I think yeah. is one of the, the bars to cross if you're going to be showing what kind of someone absolutely yeah, losing it to drugs. <laughs> yeah, some people actually compared you not disturbed to Requiem for a Dream. I think in the, I think it was the editing that made them. I don't know, but I could definitely see that the quick cuts kind of the 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 moving around a lot the the, the malleability of time i could definitely see that yeah. um well yeah, but john i've kept you a little over of our time but i wanted to say i really appreciated you spending the time for these questions and and, and yeah. giving some great answers for all those watching this you know do not disturb we'll be out theatrically in north america this friday november 17th if for whatever reason you can't catch it in a theater you should absolutely catch it at home it's going to be on vod and demand digital on the 21st um we'll have our review coming shortly but again john thank you so much um for this and we'll keep an eye out for the next work coming from you thank you